Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Ladies, welcome back. It's good to have you here. I heard it was a great time of fellowship. Just a reminder, uh, children ages three through grade five should be checked in at the Cool Kingdom Vacation Bible School so they can start their afternoon. So we're now going to have our women's breakout session with Dr. Ray Garendi. Uh, we gave him an introduction before, but just to remind you, Dr. Garendi is a Catholic father of 10 adopted children. He is a clinical psychologist, and he can be heard on our very own Real Presence Radio, in addition to being heard on more than 440 stations. Would you please welcome Dr. Ray Garendi? When I was in college, I would have dreamed of this. <laughs> My wife said, who are you going to talk to? I said, oh, honey, don't worry about it. It's a bunch of retired investment bankers. <laughs> Some of you have come over to the book table, and I owe you an apology. Um, I'm not a very good conversationalist anymore, and I can explain. I'm preoccupied. My wife and I have been getting in these little tiffs, and every time we do, she brings up the same theme. Ray, would you please get out of the 70s, ladies? One thing about us guys, you know this. All you have to do is tell us to do something one time, we do it. <laughs> I'm sensing incredulity here. I told my wife, I said, if you want me to do something, just tell me. You don't have to keep reminding me every six months. I didn't want to hear this get out of the 70s stuff anymore. So I was going to go out and get her a gift for our anniversary. And I'm not going to bring any of my daughters with me. I have five boys and five estrogen Americans. I'm not going to bring any of my girls with me. My girls know their mother up one side, down the other. My boys don't even know they had a mother half the time. You know, the average five-year-old girl walks up to her mother, um, excuse me, mother, while I do appreciate the guidance you've given me on these first few years, I feel compelled to tell you you were wrong on most of it, okay? Why don't you raise dad? He's got about six or seven more years of middle school to go through. <laughs> the average 16-year-old boy is still doing this. Mom, mom, where's the ice cubes? No, I asked Dad. He don't know where they are either. My daughter Liz is 22. For the last six or seven years, she's been able to run the whole family. My son Peter is 24, still giving his brother wedgies. I mean, these are not the same species. I didn't want to hear this get out of the 70s stuff. I'm putting a stop to it. So I went out, and I bought her one of those mood rings. See, that's kind of how she reacted, sort of like that. Okay, ladies, fine. You go ahead and laugh. Those things work. They do. When she's in a good mood, turns green. When she's in a bad mood, leaves a red mark on my forehead. <laughs> Not so long ago, Time Magazine had a cover story. Men and women are different. Only Time Magazine could think this was a revelation. <laughs> we are different. And in part, accepting that difference will give you some peace. For example, as I said this morning, now you ladies are more verbal than us guys. It comes to you more naturally. A couple will come into my office. And the wife will have a pretty good sense of what's going on in that marriage. I'll ask the husband. Well, and he'll say, I thought everything was going pretty good. <laughs> You're more aware. First day of first grade, I asked my son, Andrew, how was school today? Okay. That's good. So, so what'd you do? 
Nothing. Or ladies, if you have a very communicative sharing mail, stuff. <laughs> what is the name of the lady who stands in front of you for six and a half hours? I don't think she told anybody, Dad. Joshua says that he's got one called teacher. I'll ask her if they're related. The first day of kindergarten, I asked my daughter, Hannah, how was school today, baby? Well, okay, Daddy, my teacher's name is Mrs. Bartley. Mrs. Bartley has three children, Jessica, Jason, and Ashley. I know their birthdays, favorite colors, and middle names. I'll tell you those later. We did 12 activities, the pumpkin cutting activity. We started at 8.07. Is that a stupid time or what? Ashley was my best friend till 8.30 then. She got mad at me. I don't even know what I did. But Jessica told Tiffany I could be her forever friend till tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Now, Mrs. Bartley has this little brown mark right here. You can't tell us there unless she goes over to the window and she bends down like this. If she does, the sun comes through Venetian blinds, off the clock, reflects through her bifocals, forms a prism on the window with a brown dot. Now, Daddy, she didn't know it was there, so I figured it's about time somebody told her. They both had the same teacher. So the first thing I would say, ladies, to help you increase your patience... We guys, as a group, are not as good as you are at understanding your own feelings, at sizing up social situations, at being able to solve these kinds of emotional problems. You know, in the old days, women needed men because we killed stuff. We built stuff. We protected. You know, that was kind of our role. Well, nowadays, that's not the way it is anymore. You're more educated than we are. You can make your own money. You're pretty much safe. You're the safest culture we've ever had. So what happens is the guys are told to be more like women. Now, that's not bad because you ladies have great characteristics, but it doesn't come as easy to us. So as a result, many moms, many wives get frustrated because the guys can't really talk at the level that the women can. Now, not always, but that is one thing. And I think, I tell the guys, I always say this to them, you don't have to be as good a communicator as your wife, but what you want to do is know how she thinks. They'll be sitting in my office, and the wife will say, he doesn't back me up with his mother. And I will say, do you know why she thinks that? And he will say, no. And then I will say, how long have you been married? 28 years. You've never asked her why she thinks this? So I tell the fellas, ask your wife questions to know why she thinks the way she does so you can get inside her head and at least be able to explain it even if you don't agree with it. Now there's another aspect here. You have heard when St. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Three times. Now the, the rabbis in those days said three. Three, you're out. So St. Peter said seven times, figuring, okay, Jesus is going to figure, I'm getting this forgiveness stuff right here. You know what I mean? Because the rabbis say three, I've been hanging with Jesus for all this time. He's a merciful guy. I'm going to say seven. So you know what Jesus said. He said 70 times seven. Now that's not 490. That's completely and always. And that makes me nervous. I'll tell you why. I got to find a way that I don't have to forgive that much. Really, I'd like to be able to cut that in half, you know? And I discovered it, and I think it might be relevant to you too. I have found that much of the time that I think I need to forgive, whether it's my wife, a friend, my grown children, somebody, I don't have to forgive. That's right, I don't. 
You know why? Because they didn't do anything wrong. It was in my head. I know why she said that. She said that because she was putting me down. That's why she said that. And in fact, that was not why she said that. But I decided that was her motive. And so therefore, I got to forgive her for that ugly motive. But wait a minute. What if I'm wrong? What if that wasn't her motive? So then what happens is I go to confession over there and I say, Father, you got to help me forgive my friend who does these kinds of things. What if half the time my friend doesn't do those kinds of things? I take it that way. See, I'm a shrink. I've been shrinking for over 40 years. I used to be like 6'9". <clears throat> and one of the biggest mistakes people make is that they impute a motive to somebody. You know, I can see what you did. I can hear what you did. But it's really hard for me to figure out why you did it. And that's where most of us have a hard time forgiving people. Think about it. If I think that you were deliberately putting me down, for example, okay, ladies, now I know one of the hardest things for you to do is to shut your mouth with your daughter or your daughter-in-law in the way that she and her husband are raising those kids. You know it. Now, part of the reason she gets angry at you is because if you open your mouth, she doesn't interpret it as, well, you know, my mother, my mother-in-law has had a lot of experience and she's just trying to help me. Isn't that nice of her? You know, I think I could learn from her. No, she doesn't think that way. She thinks this. Quit trying to tell me my parenting is deficient. Quit trying to make me feel I'm not as good at it as you are. Quit trying to make me feel I'm not as religious as you are, so you shove your religion down my throat. I'll baptize my baby if and when I want to. Don't keep asking when I'm going to baptize my baby. So what she does is she imputes motives to you, right? Now you say to yourself, but those weren't my motives. I didn't mean to do that. But she's mad at me because of that. Well... How often do we do that to others? I'm going to be upset at you because I know what you really meant when you said that. I know what you're really thinking. So I'm mad at you. But that's okay. Because I'm holy. And in my holiness, I'm going to forgive you. Wait a minute. You're wrong. There was nothing to forgive. So I've discovered that about half the time, at least, that I think I need to forgive somebody for what they said or did, I don't. Because what they did wrong was in my head. It wasn't real. Sometimes I'll ask people in my office, when's the last time you apologized to your spouse? Oh, here are answers like this. Oh, I was... Um, I remember exactly. My, uh, my daughter's first communion. Well, how old is your daughter now? Oh, she's an attorney. I remember when I apologized. It was um, our wedding rehearsal dinner. And I spilled some coffee on her lap. And I said, hey, sorry about that. I'm sorry are two of the toughest words to say. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. For example... My experience has been, now I don't know if this is accurate in reality, but this is my experience, is that the ladies say I'm sorry easier than the guys do. And you may live with somebody who doesn't say I'm sorry very often. And you think to yourself, you know why he doesn't? Because he never thinks he's wrong, that's why. He's always right. He's full of himself. Uh-uh, you're wrong, you're totally wrong. Somebody who doesn't say, I'm sorry, by and large, is insecure. If I can't tell you I'm sorry, it's because I'm telling myself what I think I'm sorry means. It means, well, you'll think you're right then and that I'm all wrong. Or you'll think I'm a bad person. That's why I'm not going to say I'm sorry. Or if I, if I say I'm sorry, you know what you're going to do? You're going to throw it back on my face. You're going to say things like, well... 
If you're really sorry, then show it. Sorry is just words. You need to live it. You need to change. Oh, really? How many of you went to confession over there? A bunch of you. How would you like the priest to say, someone that you've gone to confession to for the last 20 years, he knows you, and he says this to you, you know, <laughs> you come in here and you say you're sorry, and you've been doing this for 20 years. I'm not going to give you absolution, because really, sorry is just words. You know, if you're not going to change, then you're not really sorry. How would you like that? I guarantee you, you wouldn't go back to that priest again. Well, see, we do that to others. If they tell us, I'm sorry, we go, well, we think it ourselves. We may not say it out loud. Well, you know, do something about it. Don't just say, I'm sorry. That's easy. I stopped at the florists a while back. Now, I got my wife some uh, flowers first anniversary. So I figure now being married 34 years, I should get her some other flowers again. People ask my wife, how many years have you been married to Ray? She says, 18 happy years. <laughs> so I said, could I have a flower for my wife? And the florist said, what did you do? I said, what do you mean, what did I do? She said, well, when guys come in here, and it's not some holiday, they did something wrong, and they're trying to say, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 not the, not the big boy here. No, no, no. My wife and I have a very understanding relationship. She knows if I get her flowers, it's not because I did something wrong, and I'm trying to say I'm sorry. So the young girl looked at me and said, okay. Went home, and you know how little kids, when they, they, they go pick stinkweeds in the field, you know, and they hand them to their mom, and you have to get all excited about these stinkweed flowers that they give you? Oh, I had the flower behind my back, and I said, honey? And she looked at me with the warmth in her voice and said, what did you do, Ray? <laughs> I said, were you ever a florist? Now, what's the point of this? The point is this. In most situations in our life, it is easier to talk than to act. Whether it's discipline, because most discipline is talk. Most discipline for most people is talk, not act. That's the biggest mistake they make, that this is discipline. This is not discipline. This is talk. Hey, hey, you know what? We got to get together for lunch. You know, it's been a long time. Why don't we get together for lunch? Okay, that's great. Now, she calls me, and I look, and I see the caller ID, and I go, oh, she probably wants to get together for lunch. Okay, I just don't have time this week. I just won't. I'll let it go to voicemail. It's easy to say, hey, you know, you guys got a lot of leaves in your yard, and I got a blower. It just, I'm, I'll tell you, well, why don't I come over? You want me to come over sometime? I'll help you blow the leaves, okay? I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I hope they don't call. Jeez, I hope they don't call. I don't have time. But I said it. Isn't that nice of me? I mean, I made this very charitable offer with my mouth. But the action is much tougher to do. I'm sorry is the only thing that is the opposite. It is easier to act I'm sorry. You ladies know this. When you get into some kind of bicker match or fight with your husband, and he realizes that part of this was his fault, what's he do? He starts being nice. He doesn't say I'm sorry, but all the, I act I'm sorry. I start being sweeter. I start doing a little few more thoughtful things. Maybe I pick up my underwear after nine days off the floor. So what happens is he acts I'm sorry instead of says I'm sorry because saying I'm sorry has too much meaning. It has way too much meaning. And besides, here's one of the big reasons that an insecure person will not tell you I'm sorry, and that is... I don't want you to think that I'm the one who's more wrong in this. I want you to understand that if I say I'm sorry, it's because I don't really think I was the one most wrong. You got that? So if you're frustrated with someone in your life who never says I'm sorry, here's how you soften it. Recognize this isn't because they think they're superior to you. 
in most cases, it's because they think they're inferior to you. What is your personal apology percentage? I talk about that in one of the books. The personal apology percentage is this. How wrong do I have to be before I say I'm sorry? In my mind. Now keep in mind, we're not very good at judging how wrong we have to be. You go take a poll of 100 people, and they're watching you bicker with somebody, and they're going to judge, well, you're 62% wrong, and that other person's 38% wrong. And you think to yourself, whoa, no, 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 no. I think I'm about 12% wrong, and the other person is 88% wrong. So we're not very good at judging how wrong we are. But let's say that you were. Let's say that you're perfectly objective, and God would, would confirm it. How wrong do you have to be before you say, I'm sorry? Now, most people, in their mind, have to be over 50% wrong. Then they'll say, I'm sorry. But what about 32% wrong? What about 12% wrong? You got into a disagreement with somebody, spouse, and in that disagreement, you got ugly. You said things you shouldn't have said. You fired off some stuff, right? Okay. Now, as you assess the whole interchange, you were pushed to it. You wouldn't have done that, but the argument kept getting uglier and uglier and ugly, and finally, you launched. Okay, you said something you shouldn't have said. You were 12% wrong. What would happen if you said, I'm sorry for what I said, I shouldn't have said that? Now, the other person isn't going to apologize for anything they said or did. Would you be able to do that? Can you apologize for your percentage, however low it is? Because, see, Jesus doesn't say, well, you apologize when you think you're more than half wrong. He says you apologize for what you did wrong, however much you think it was what he says how easily offended are you I get calls like this on the radio all the time I don't want to be around my cousin why well because she, she, she makes these little snipes about my religion about my children everything she has is better than ours Okay, well, how much are you around her? Well, we try to be around her as little as possible. Maybe Christmas Eve. Every once in a while, my mom's still alive, so that's where everybody gathers. Okay. So your cousin offends you. Yes. Why does she offend you? Because she says things. Daddy, why? Why does she offend you? Because she's snotty. No, that ain't why. Why does she offend you? Because the stuff she says is ridiculous. And she doesn't even look at herself. That's why. That's not why. You know why she offends you? Because <laughs> you get offended. She has no right to talk to me like that. I don't talk to her like that. She has no right to say those things. I'm not that way. And if she had any kind of charity, you know the woman goes to church three times a week? Do you believe that? She goes to church three times a week. And she's one of the most difficult people in my life. You get offended because you protect yourself. These people should not be doing this to me. I don't deserve this. That's why you get offended. Did uh, Jesus sin against anybody? He got a lot of a opprobrium. He got a lot of words thrown his way, a lot of accusations. Did he do anything to deserve that? You follow a master who was perfect, and yet we get upset because people say things that we think are ridiculous or nonsense or hurtful or attacking. People always say this to me. I couldn't believe she said that. I was so hurt. Well, it's one thing to say I didn't like what she said. Not a pleasant thing. I got that part of it. But see, then we take it personal. She hurt me. No. No, you took what she said 
and you allowed it to hurt you because what she said was a bunch of words. Let me show you how powerful thoughts are. Picture a bus stop, three-sided bus stop, very crowded. People are crunching together because it's a North Dakota November 3rd. It is sleeting, it is windy, and it is cold. And that rain is blowing into that bus stop, and everybody's moving toward the back like this, trying to get out of the rain, but it's no good. And so it's an ugly, unpleasant weather scenario. You're standing there, and all of a sudden, on your heel, you feel a jabbing. It's like, ow, oh, ow. Oh. And it feels like the point of an umbrella, because you figure somebody's just now jabbing with the umbrella. And you're thinking to yourself, what the heck's going on here? Now, we're all crowded together, and this person is playing some kind of game or whatever. At the very least, they're thoughtless. And this goes on. This is not a one or two time thing. This is a six, eight, ten time thing. If I were to ask you at that moment, why are you upset? Why are you getting so angry? You'd say, because somebody is poking me. You turn around. You can't take it anymore. You turn around. Because you're going to say, you're at least going to glare at them if you at least don't say something. It's an elderly blind woman with a cane who is being jostled and disoriented. And she's, she's putting her cane down trying to just at least stand up because she's unsteady on her feet. What happened to your anger at that moment? Did you think to yourself, oh, you're lucky you're old and can't see, because I'll tell you what, I'd punch you dead in the head. No, you would say, ooh, ooh. And your anger would be gone in a split second. Wait a minute. You're still being poked. You told me the reason you were mad is because you were being poked. That was not the reason you were mad. The reason you were mad is because you interpreted the poke as somebody doing something either thoughtless or malicious. And when you found out it was not, you reinterpreted it, and the anger completely dissolved. That fast, just like that. Now, you can't snap your fingers and get rid of anger or misinterpretations or hostility or hurt or whatever. But you can ask yourself a question. How am I looking at this? There's a chapter in one of my books. I call it closing the book. Here's what it means. Most people, when they want to avoid another person, do so because the bad interactions have built up. It, it, it's been going on now for some time. You know, my mother-in-law, I got I to gotta associate with her, or my brother, or my sister-in-law, I got to deal with them, and you know, as, as little as possible, but I have to deal with them. But when I do have to deal with them, there's always that chance that they're going to add to the pile. So what happens is, as the pile grows, we get more and more susceptible to being angry or hurt. Because the pile's growing, you know? It's not like they did this three times. They've done this 203 times, okay? So it's building up here. A better way to look at this would be to what I call close the book. For example, if I say to you, how long's she been like that? <laughs> Ever since I've known her. How many years is that? 17? She changed any? Mm, not really. It's kind of who she is. Uh, does she show any insight into how she is? No, no, she doesn't see herself. Huh. So you think likelihood in the next 17 years she's not going to change? Probably not. Then why does it still have the power to bug you? Close the book. You know who she is. You know who he is. They've been like this for 17 years. Why does it still have the power to do this to you? It should be losing power. You should be saying, hey, <laughs> what do I expect? This is kind of the way they act. And it should be dampening in its power. Instead, it's gone up. Wait a minute. 
That's putting your emotional well-being into the hands of another human being. One of the things I see in marriages is that generally the spouses hook on to something that really bugs them. Really bugs them. And because of that, it builds up and it tends to overshadow a lot of the rest of the marriage. For example, if I have someone say to me, oh, you know, I get nervous sometimes the way my husband disciplines. He, he seems kind of like, he seems kind of firm. Is he a, a bad dad? Oh, no, he's a wonderful dad. Well, you think he's going to hurt the kids? Oh, no, he'd never do that. So you're, you're upset about what? Well, he just, I don't know, he just seems so kind of intimidating, you know, kind of commanding. I said, oh, you mean he seems like a guy? I said, let him be a guy. He doesn't discipline like a woman. All the research says this too, by the way. We guys tend to be more intimidating. We tend to have deeper voices. Because women will say this to me. Why do they listen to their dad? All he has to do is just look at them. Well, we, be, we begin with a certain inherent advantage that is wired into little kids. It's like, he's big. That dude is big. I don't know. He looks intimidating. So these, these things just become part of the marriage. I'll share with you something. I'm kind of a neat Nick. And God is a practical joker. Because you can't be a neat Nick when you have 10 children under 12 that make your house smell like a swamp. Okay? There's no way you can be a neat Nick. None of your walls look good. I like those walls. I like it. It's just a paint job. I, I painted that yesterday. It needs to be painted again. It was yesterday. I can't be a neat Nick. So when we first got married, my wife would leave cupboard doors open. I'd go in and I'd see these cupboard doors open in the kitchen. So I'd say, hey, honey, hey, babe. You left the doors open. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Ray. I'll do that. I'll take care of that. She'd shut the doors. Problem solved, right? <laughs> no, because every time she opened a cupboard door, for the most part, she didn't close it. Now, me being a psychologist and a gentle-spirited soul, I thought, well, I, I need to take subtle action to handle this recurrent marital problem. So... One of the things I did was one day I went in and I saw eight or ten cupboard doors open, so I, I shut them. Bam! Bam! Somebody called the cops because they thought there were gunshots. <laughs> now that wasn't very cool. It's early in our marriage. It wasn't very nice at all. So I thought, no, nah, Ray, you can't do that. You got to do something that is a little less loud, but a little more impactful. So what I did, next time I saw half the cupboard doors open, I opened them all. Every single cupboard door. And my sweet wife came down and went, <gasps> I did that? Yeah, baby, you did. Now, my wife, in football language, if I can say this, I can say this analogy to guys, because guys would understand this. And I said, some of you ladies might understand this. With my wife, I outkicked my coverage. Now that's a football analogy that basically says I am way beyond anything that I deserve in a wife. Flat out. So what an idiotic thing to be upset at open cupboards. Is that ridiculous or what? So for the last 30 years, you know what I do? When I see them open, I close them. It's okay. I can close them. It's no big deal. But you know what the problem was? And this is where you got to watch. I took it personally. She didn't care enough about my request. She didn't care enough about how nice I asked. She didn't care enough about how giving a man I obviously am to shut the cupboards. That had nothing to do with it. She just forgot. That's all it was. It wasn't anything aimed at me. It had nothing to do with me. But in those early years, I told myself it did. 
and I got mad. Now, is that stupid or what? That's incredibly stupid. So you ask yourself one thing. Are you doing this? Are you taking someone's behavior in your life, particularly your spouse or your parent or your adult children, and are you saying they're doing this just to, just to get to me, just to upset me, just to hurt me, just to offend me, just to make me mad? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe they're just a jerk. That could be it, you know. There are three words I want to warn you against. There are words in our vocabulary that have become very high profile. And they are words that pop psychology has given to you. And this is what typically happens. Psychology comes up with a label. And if it's a really cool label, then it seeps out into the culture and everybody starts using it. Here's the first one. He's a narcissist. He is such a narcissist. Now, do you realize, clinically speaking, how serious narcissism is? I doubt that there's probably anybody in here, maybe one or two of you, that know a true narcissist. But you use that word because that word is serious. That word conveys this person is so incredibly self-centered who cares only about himself, herself. They're just narcissistic. Well, not really. They're self-centered, or they're difficult, or they're obnoxious, or they're uninsightful, or they're unfair. Yeah. I had a lady say to me once on the radio, she goes, well, well, well I want to call him a narcissist. I said, why? Because that explains the way he is. So at least I know what he is. No, you don't. All you know is the label you put on what he is. What he is is who he is. You call it narcissism, but that doesn't explain anything. Why does he act that way? Because he's a narcissist. How do you know he's a narcissist? Because he acts that way. Well, why does he act that way? Because he's a narcissist. Don't use the word. It's an ugly word. I don't think I, I don't, I almost never call anybody that. I may say he's a self-centered jerk, but I probably don't say he's a narcissist. Well, here's another, here's another one comfort zone you know that just takes me out of my comfort zone now I have friends who won't go to a nursing home why well I know it's kind of it's sometimes it smells like urine in there you know and you know if I go in there and I see my aunt you know, that two minutes later I'm gone she never even remembers I was there half the time she doesn't even recognize me I don't know I, I just I, I don't know I just it's not I just not something I I really feel easy doing. Christians need to have comfort zones as wide as that wall to that wall. I have friends who won't go to funerals. Why? They're good people, faithful Catholics. They won't go to funerals. Why? Why do funerals make them uneasy? They don't know what to say. Hmm. Outside their comfort zone. Yeah. Get out of your comfort zone. Christians should really not have comfort zones. We should have things we don't like. We should have things that makes us anxious. We should have things we, we really are ill at ease about doing. But to say, I have a reason not to do something charitable like visit Aunt Mary in a nursing home. I know a lady whose son is in prison, and he's going to be in prison for the next 40 years. It's his mother. She won't go see him. Not because she's mad at him, because it makes her anxious. She won't go see him. Okay, so what would happen if you went and saw him? Well, I, I wouldn't feel good. I just, I don't know, it'd be so uncomfortable. Yes, yes it would. Why else? Well, I just, I, I don't want to. I just, I, no, I, maybe someday, maybe someday, but not right now. See what she's doing? She's basically saying this affects me. It's my comfort zone. I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. Christians have to have pretty broad comfort zones, and even, even if you have a comfort zone, step out of it. Expand it. Make it bigger. Here's another one. You've got to really watch this one because this goes directly against Scripture. A toxic person. You, you know, 
<clears throat> you have to get, he's toxic. You know, you just, you have to get your father-in-law out of your life. He's just toxic. He causes so much trouble for you. You get so anxious when you're around him. You get so, he's just a, a toxic individual. So if you're going to function well, you've got to get rid of toxic people. There's very few toxic people in the sense that they're dangerous or they're sexually a problem. Yeah, there are those. But most people who are quote unquote toxic are obnoxious. <laughs> they're difficult. They're not pleasant to be around. We don't really care for them in our lives. And if it's the, if it's the neighbor lady six houses down, then you don't have to see her very much. She's six houses down. You drive by, she's mowing her lawn, so what? What if it's your adult son? What if it's your husband's mother? What if it is your sister? You see, I don't argue that they're not ugly, at least to you. Other people might think they're wonderful. Think about that too, okay? Everybody we think is ugly and toxic, there are those people who think they're not ugly and toxic. So that does tell you it is somewhat in our perception or the way they treat us. When somebody's toxic, most counselors will tell you, the bulk of counselors will tell you, get them out of your lives. Don't have anything to do with them. Shut them out. That's what they'll tell you. Now, would a Christian do that? You don't have to give them a big kiss on the lips, and you don't have to think, they are the most wonderful person I ever met. You don't have to think, you don't have to think any of that. You can think, this person's the most difficult human being in my life. Okay, right? I don't like being around them. I got that, neither would I. But it is your mother-in-law. It is your son. You gonna write them off? They're toxic. No, they're not toxic. They're not poisonous to you. So much of how you interpret them is in your head. We had a neighbor lady who, in a lot of respects, was one major league difficult lady. Okay? Really, she was. And it would have been so easy just not to have anything to do with her. But we didn't, because she lived 40 feet away. And when we started adopting kids, she had her preferences for which of our kids she liked, and it took her a while to like this one and not like that one. But we rolled with her at the end of her life when she was in a nursing home. We were the, probably among her most favored people on earth. I gotta believe that most people would have said, don't, just, just ignore that woman, get, go, get in your car and don't even look over there when she's out in the swimming pool, just walk away. She's toxic. I think really for Christians, the only toxic people in our life should be people that are truly dangerous. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be around them all the time, for heaven's sakes. You know, some, some people are just ugly to be around, and it takes effort. But remember this, they only have the power to do to you what you allow. You should see some of the email I get. My wife wants to kill them. I had a lady write to me one time and she said, I wish you would roast in hell. I had another one write to me and say, I, uh, I used to love to listen to you. Now the sound of your voice makes me want to throw up. Now, okay, <laughs> I really don't respond. What are you going to say? In the, in the beginning, I used to respond. I used to say, well, you know, I'm sorry you think that way. I didn't mean to come across that way, etc. And, and, and you know what happens when I write that? They write back and they say, I'm so sorry, Dr. Ray. I didn't really realize that you had meant I misunderstood. No, they fire back even harder. So I decided it's probably best not to do that. You realize how upset I could keep myself? I would have got out of this business. There's no question I would have got out of this business. You can't have a radio show where you deal with people's emotional issues and you're going to get somebody who's going to write you and say, you were totally wrong because that happened to me and, th and what you advised doesn't work at all and you're an evil person and you need to really think you being on the radio. Yeah, I mean, that happens. There's just no way around that. So are they toxic? Nah. Kind of sad, really. 
And that's sort of how I interpreted it. Kind of sad. It is easy to, to forgive somebody when you're not easily offended. It is easy to forgive somebody when you recognize you could be wrong about what they meant. It is hard to be offended when you don't take things so personally. When you realize you follow a master who deserved no ugly feedback whatsoever and they killed him. Anybody want to kill you? Jesus says, get the log out of your eye before you take a speck out of somebody else's. I don't think that just means, well, you, before you correct somebody, make sure you can see. No, no, I think it means more than that. What does it mean to have a log in your eye? It means you can't see. It means you can't see yourself. As a shrink... I cannot work with any person whatsoever who does not at least admit that they are a certain way. If they don't, we go nowhere. So, I know I just shared with you a few thoughts about all of this. And part of it is, you know, I'm a lot older than I used to be. This is as old as I've ever been. And I'm kind of like the old guy, you know, that gets to the point where you just go, ah. One time my son, he's about 17 years old, he's walking down the driveway with a couple of his buddies. So I went over to the window and I opened it up and I said, hey you kids, get off my driveway. My son turns around and goes, run, it's old man Ray. <laughs> I want to close with another touching marriage story. I think this is, and this is a true story by the way. It's my uncle Giuseppe. He was at a marriage conference, and the priest said, Giuseppe, how long you been married? 48 years. 48 years, Giuseppe. Would you tell these young men how to make a marriage last 48 years? Well, you got to do nicer things. Always remember the special of days. For our 25th anniversary, I take her to Italy. Priest says, Giuseppe, that's beautiful now. Two more years, you're at 50. What are you going to do then? For my 50, I'm going to go get her and bring her back. <laughs> I hope I gave you a few good thoughts. <laughs>